Okay, welcome to chapter seven. Um, I, in this chapter, I've opted to not integrate the videos with this chapter, um, just because it's already a pretty long chapter. Uh, but, the, but there are videos available. You'll see them listed underneath the, the folder for this chapter. Um, I encourage you to watch those videos. Don't hesitate to watch this lecture and then stop and go watch a video and then come back to this lecture. Remember, the, the, this lecture is always going to be there, so you don't have to watch it start to finish. You can watch it for a while, come back and pick up where you left off, um, do a little bit of reading in between, that kind of thing, so this stuff sinks in. Um, the nervous system chapter can be a pretty complicated chapter. There's a lot of new words in here, new phrases, uh, terminology, concepts, and those types of things that are going to be kind of tricky to grab, so um, you may have to watch it a couple of times to get it. Um, don't get discouraged. Um, uh, keep reaching out there and looking at some of those resources that are available. Um, look under the uh, um, the uh, resources folder. I can't remember. It's not called resources, but there's a, a folder there um, listed underneath um, the course that you can look at um, that has some resources uh, there. And if you find some resources that are helpful that you thought helped you, send me an email. Let me know, and I'll add them to the list. Um, because we're always looking for good study resources. Okay, so chapter seven, the nervous system. It sounds like it's a simple thing. Um, it's only in one chapter. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, in a lot of anatomy books, this would encompass two or three, sometimes four chapters. So what we're going to learn today about this is really kind of just a tertiary knowledge, um, just a surface knowledge, um, and uh, and the, realize that there is more that you can probably learn about this. There's probably more that all of us can learn. So um, I'll try to get down into the weeds enough to where that you have a good, a good foundational understanding, um, but just realize uh, uh, there's probably going to be more to the story, okay? All right, so we're going to start off talking about the functions of the nervous system. Um, of course, one of the main functions of the nervous system is gathering sensory input or gathering information. Um, and it monitors the changes inside and outside of the body. Um, and those changes that it senses are what we refer to as stimuli or stimulus um, or a sensation. Um, it also does some integration. It takes some of those processes. It takes those, that sensory input, like when somebody tickles us or you know, pokes us with a needle or something like that. It takes that information brings it into our brain and then it integrates it with other things to decide whether there's something that needs to go on or to process what that means or you know try to make a determination try to make sense of things that's the integration phase that's the intellect the the cognitive phase of what's going on inside of our brain and then there's the motor output um, that's the phase of where we you know we move we walk we talk we do things um, we pull our hand away from a hot pot you know, we slap somebody when they, you know, you know, do something that they shouldn't or, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's after we've kind of, the brain's had a chance to figure out what it needs to do. Um, now, there are some, some, re, some things that happen within our body that doesn't require a whole lot of integration all the way up to the brain. Some of that stuff just happens from a, a quick reaction or a quick, quick um, pathway in the spinal cord. Um, and those are what we call reflexes, and we'll talk about the different types of reflexes that are built into us um, a little bit later and, and uh, realize those reflexes are more of a safety feature. Um, they're more of a protective response than anything. Um, so we look at this picture here, and it talks about sensory input. We see something. Um, you know, we see a, uh, a man with a gun. I don't know why it's a man with a gun. It could be a bear in the woods or anything. But uh, we see something and we, it processes in our brain and it causes us to think, well, I need to do something about that. And we send a signal back out of our brain um, to do something. Uh, and that's the motor output, sensory integration and then output. Um, of course, the, uh, like every other part of the body, every other organ system in the body, uh, the nervous system is classified based on structures and activities. So the structure of what it, what it is, what it's shaped like, as well as what it does. So that's how the, the nervous system is classified, is based upon those things, either its structure or what it does. Uh, either or, sometimes both, that it can be classified as. So the first, uh, the first thing that we'll look at is the structural classification. Uh, 
Um, and there's two sides to this. The first side is the central nervous system, and it encompasses the brain and the spinal cord. There's two parts. There's two halves, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system has the brain and the spinal cord. That's all that it involves. Um, its function is for integration of the commands, interpretation of sensory information, and issuing instructions. Okay, so it's, it's where all the higher functioning goes on. Um, the integration and all those types of things that takes place at this level. The peripheral nervous system, on the other hand, have nerves that extend from the brain and spinal cord called the spinal nerves that carry impulses to, from the spinal cord and carry impulses to the brain, from the, carry impulses to and from the spinal cord and to and from the brain. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. I'm trying to read too fast. Um, and it, these nerves actually serve as communication lines, so it's kind of like the phone lines. Um, uh, if you guys ever watched any of the old-time movies where you had a phone operator in there and, and she's um, answering calls and, and plugging in lines in different holes or different spots and she's connecting telephone lines, well, that's how the telephone company actually worked. You had an operator that was actually patching, you know, one one phone line to another phone line so you could talk to that person. That's how the phone companies worked and they had these huge patch panels where that, you know, that's all that that person would do all day long is patch one phone call to the next or one or plug one person to the next person. Well, that's kind of what our brain does and then outside of that is the nerves, the nervous system, the wires that come into it. So the wires that come into that station where the, where the operator was, was the peripheral nervous system. And where she sat, she was the integral part. She was the brain uh, of the um, central nervous system. So central and peripheral is two, two different parts. Um, of the peripheral nervous system, there's, that breaks down again into two more parts. So central nervous system, all one part. Peripheral nervous system, now we're breaking it down into two parts. The two parts are the afferent division, the, the division that carry information to the central nervous system, okay? And the efferent division that carries information away. The afferent division is going to carry information from things, um, from sensory nerves uh, located throughout the body. In, in the skeleton, we call it uh, somatic and in the organs we call it visceral. So somatic and visceral, the sensory division can be divided into somatic and visceral divisions. The efferent division are fibers that carry impulses away from the brain and the central nervous system. The easiest way to remember these are, if it's a signal going into the brain like you stubbed your toe um, and, it, and it hurts and it sends a signal to the brain to let you know that that hurt, um, that is an efferent signal or I'm sorry, an afferent signal. That signal is going to the brain. A signal that's going away from the brain that makes you pull your toe back and, and hop on one foot because of the pain is the efferent division. It is sending a signal out. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Alka-Seltzer, um, but Alka-Seltzer is called effervescent, meaning we drop the little plop, plop, fizz, fizz, we drop the tablets in the water and they fizz because the bubbles actually go away from the tablet. That is efferent. That means going away. So when, we, when a signal is coming out of the brain, going to a target organ or a muscle or something like that away from the brain, that is efferent. Um, afferent is something that's coming into the brain. So we have an afferent signal that comes into the brain. The brain processes it and sends an efferent signal out. Okay, so sometimes that's the easiest way to remember afferent and efferent. Um, so on the motor side, on the efferent side, on the side that's going away from the body, there's two subdivisions there too. Great, huh? We have the somatic nervous system, which is the voluntary system, and the autonomic nervous system, which is involuntary. And guess what? The autonomic nervous system actually branches into two more systems a little bit deeper, and those are the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Oh my goodness. So we have this whole system that breaks down into all of these branches, all the way down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So 
the way to remember sympathetic, parasympathetic, are the, those are our fight or flight responses. Like if somebody jumps out from around the corner at us and it scares us and our heart rate speeds up and we jump and we start to, you know, we're, our body's ready to fight or run or panic or whatever, that's the sympathetic side. We have a sympathetic tone. We have a sympathetic reaction. Um, and that's what's happening there. Now, on the other hand, we, if we go out and we eat a big meal, like we go to lunch, we, we uh, leave class or leave work and we go to lunch and we come back and we have trouble focusing and we can't hold our eyes open because we're tired and we're like, man, I got a great night's sleep. Why am I so tired? Well, what happens is, is eating all that food actually stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. The body says, hey, look, you've taken on all this food. We need to focus on digesting this. So we're going to kind of slow everything else down so we can focus on this. That's the parasympathetic side of things. The thing to remember about the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic and parasympathetic sides is those are always in constant battle with each other. You, you don't really have one necessarily always, you, you don't have one on and the other one off. What you have is, is it's like a, it's like a, um, a balance scales, a set of scales that are, in, that are balancing. And you have one that kind of takes over and one that kind of lets up and they, they kind of ebb and flow back and forth. So it's not like one is on and the other one's off and vice versa. It's they're, they're both balancing and competing. When everything's normal and, and, and everything's average, they're, they're in good balance. Somebody jumps out from around the corner at you and scares the, scares the water out of you, then that's going to give you a sympathetic, and that means the sympathetic nervous system is going to kind of take over a little bit, and the parasympathetic nervous system is going to kind of go in the background a little more. So both will kind of happen. And then the reverse is going to happen when we have that big meal at lunchtime. So um, here's a really good chart to kind of break this down. We have the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, okay? And the peripheral nervous system that is the, the spinal nerves, the cranial and the spinal nerves. That breaks down into two divisions, the sensory division, which brings information in, right? And the motor division that sends information out. In the motor division, it breaks down into two. The somatic, which are all the things that we can control, our skeletal muscles and walking and all that. The other side is the autonomic, the automatic side, the things that we don't have to control, such as our heart beating, our breathing, our smooth muscles, our blood pressure, the glands, and the release of hormones, and all those kinds of things that happen automatically without us. Within that autonomic nervous system, there is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay? So that is kind of a general overview of the workings of the central nervous system, okay? Um, the branches and the workings. Okay. When we start talking about nerve tissues, the, the cells that make up the nervous system, it's important that we start off talking about the support cells. There are cells in, within the nervous system that are not technically nerve cells. They're nerve cells because they're part of the nervous system, but they're more supportive cells than they are actual nerves sending and receiving impulses. These, these are very, very important cells for us to discuss and for us to talk about is because they're vital to protecting all of the other real neurons, the nerves that are doing things. They also provide some support and insulation and those types of things. Um, these are grouped together uh, and we call them neuralgia. Um, it's just the common grouping of, of how we, uh, we, we call them as a group. Okay, So there are individual neuralgia um, that we're going to talk about, but as a group this is what they are and these are the support cells of the nervous system. Okay, The uh, first of these are the glia cells, or the glia cells, glial cells, sorry, uh, called astrocytes. These are, there's a lot of these, they're star-shaped, and they help brace and hold neurons in their places. Um, so it's kind of a supporting structure inside there. It also provides some barriers between the capillaries and the neurons, so it kind of, it's kind of a support structure that holds capillaries um, and neurons in their places so they don't get all squished up in there. Um, and they also help control the chemical environment of the brain. It's part of that blood-brain barrier um, that help protect the brain from things that can be harmful to the neurons. Neurons are very sensitive, um, so they need to be protected from 
certain chemicals and things that are out there are that, that can get into our bodies and it needs to be protected from that. And we can see a picture of it here. Um, it's wrapped around a, ca you know, a capillary there and it's also wrapped around a nerve so it kind of holds them in place. So it says, all right, I want you guys to stay right here. It's the most abundant of the neuralgia in the body um, because that's what it's doing. There's a micro, micro gila or micro gila. Um, it's a spider-like phagocyte, meaning it disposes of debris and things that don't belong. So it's kind of the housekeeper um, that kind of moves around in there. Um, so that's it's gonna that's gonna be its job, um, kind of stationed throughout and keeping things clean, keeping things cleaned up and safe inside of the inside of the those environments, the neuro, the nervous system environments. Then there's some epidemial cells. They line the cavities of the brain and spinal cord, um, and they help with moving cerebral spinal fluid around inside of those cavities. I know we haven't talked about cerebral spinal fluid yet. We will talk about that, but just be aware that there is space around and inside of the brain and the spinal cord that fluid actually moves through, and that fluid is not blood. It is cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it is the fluid that floats that that surrounds and the brain literally floats in um, that provides some protection nourishment and various different types of things um, and some cushioning um, and we can see the picture of those with their their little uh, tentacles sticking up there oleodendrocytes wrap around the nerve fibers of the central nervous system and these produce what's called myelian sheaths okay um, these sheaths, we can see here, they're wrapped around a nerve. Um, and, uh, and what these do is these wrap around the nerve and they have a purpose of either protecting the nerve or actually making the nerve transmit a little bit faster. Um, but we can see where one of these can wrap around several of them. Now, this is oleodendrocyte. There are some different ones that make, create myelian sheaths as well. Um, but this is oleodendrocyte that does that. Um, we have satellite cells and Schwann cells. Um, satellite cells actually protect neuron bodies. They surround and protect the bodies of a neuron, and that's, that's these uh, oleodendrocytes. It's a type of oleodendrocyte. Schwann cells, a different type of oleodendrocyte, form myelian sheaths um, in the peripheral nervous system. So we're going to see satellite cells predominantly, not always, but predominantly in the central nervous system, and Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. The Schwann cells are what create, gives us, puts a myelian sheath around nerve endings or nerves in the peripheral nervous system. And we'll take a look at those right here. We can see the satellite cell in purple surrounding that um, cell body, but we see these little Schwann cells, these little blue blobs along that nerve um, that are around that nerve fiber. And you see the gap in between each one of those, that gap is significant. Um, we call that a gap junction, um, and what happens is, is by having those Schwann cells on the outside of that nerve or on down the length of that nerve, it enables that when we get in a, when we get a uh, uh, um, oh my, I'm losing my train of thought, but when we get a nerve impulse coming down that nerve, it allows that impulse to jump in between the gaps, so it doesn't have to go through where the blue portion is. It kind of jumps the gap. So that nerve impulse goes down the length of that nerve a lot faster. Um, a myelinated nerve will transmit an in a, a nerve impulse at a much faster rate than an unmyelinated one. So most of the muscles in our body, especially the skeletal muscles, are myelinated nerves. So the nerves, the, the nerves that feed those muscles are myelinated. That way it gives a, we can actually have faster responses or quick responses with our muscles. If it wasn't, our responses would be a little bit slower. So that's what the Schwann cells do. They create the myelian sheath down the length of the uh, um, nerve, the nerve fiber or the, the, the nerve axion. And then the satellite cells would be the ones that actually cover the, the nucleus or the cell body. Okay? Right, so now let's talk about the actual nerve cells. We've talked about the supporting cells. Let's talk about the actual nerve cells. Um, and we refer to these nerve cells as neurons is what we call them. 
Um, and these cells are specialized in a way to where that they can transmit messages. Um, what's interesting is, is it's not like you know, it's you sending a text message to somebody. It is sending a message in electrical form. And when it sends that message in an electrical form, the same thing happens. So, for instance, um, when you walk over and you flip the light switch on in your bedroom, the light comes on in your room, you know. Uh, and that's, that's what it does. It's because that light switch is wired to the light. You don't turn the light switch on and your car start. Hopefully not. Um, uh, because that, you, that, that much like the electrical, the electrical wiring in your house, if everything's like it's supposed to be, um, neurons are going to do one purpose. A nerve is going to do one purpose, meaning uh, nerve, you know, nerve one, two, three in your body uh, makes your pinky toe wiggle. Um, that when your brain stimulates that nerve, your pinky toe is going to wiggle. Um, it's, you're not going to sneeze. Um, so what I'm getting at is, is these nerves are only going to innervate one, one particular area. So we need a lot of nerves, a lot of neurons. So not only do we have them in our, in our body, in our, in our uh, arms and legs and our tissues, but there's a lot of them in our brain because that's where we store all of this information and we process it. Um, and this chapter does not talk about memories and saving memories and short-term, long-term memory and how all that works, um, which I'm glad because it's very complicated and I don't really understand it all that well myself, probably not enough that you would want me being the guy lecturing you about it. But neurons are nerve cells. Um, there's major reason, regions of these neurons. We have the cell body that's going to contain the nucleus and the metabolic centers of the cell. And then we have the processes, the fibers that come out and extend from the cell body. Um, when we look at neurons, we usually think of them as kind of all looking the same, but there's different types of neurons. Um, within the cell body, there's some nissel cells. Um, these are specialized rough endoplasmic reticulum. There's some neurofibrils, which help kind of give us a shape and, the, and maintains a cytoskeleton in there. And then there's a nucleus um, with a large nucleolus. So um, that's typically what we see inside of these. Um, what we don't see inside of these is that ability of this cell to regenerate itself well. It does not have that ability. And um, the further we get away from the cell body, you know, when we look at the tail of that neuron, um, when the further we get away from the cell body, the, the less regenerative abilities that it has. So um, that kind of puts it at a, a big disadvantage. So we can see up there in the cell body, um, all of the, all of the, all, everything up here that's contained in it, got the nissel and the neurofibrils, you know, and then uh, the nucleus right in here. And then this right here is uh, something that, that, uh, that is important to understand or learn. It's called the axion hillock. Um, and, and what happens here is if this is the end that a signal is going to be received in, so a signal is going to come in here, and it's going to cause um, sodium and, and uh, potassium channels to open up along here because we've stimulated this membrane, and then that's going to travel down to here, um, and it's going to cause you know this cell membrane to kind of change in here, but it's guarded. So if it's not a strong enough stimulus for it to reach all the way down here and cause this these gated channels to open up, if it's not strong enough to do that, then that nerve is not going to send this impulse that it got up here. It's not going to send it all the way down. Okay? So this impulse that comes in here needs to be strong enough to get in through here and cause this area right here to fire off. Once this area fires off the axion hillock, it will go the full length. That, that impulse will go the full length these gated sodium channels, sodium and potassium channels that are along the length of that will open and it will cause an electrical change within the, uh, the length of this, um, within the axion of this, and that nerve impulse will go down. It'll go down this one pretty fast because it'll skip the nodes. It'll skip these nodes just like this as it goes down there. I know it, 
it seems kind of weird, but that's really what it does. It just kind of skips down because these actually manage to be able to transmit that impulse more rapidly. Okay. All right, and there's a picture of one. It looks like a spider web. Um, and I don't know how they can tell that's a dendrite down there, but I guess they know that. <laughs> All right. So outside of the cell body, we talked about this a little bit already, but we have the dendrites, which are, in that particular picture we looked at, those were the, the finger-like projections that were closest to the cell body. Um, and those conduct impulses towards the cell body. Just like I showed you, that's the dendrites were up there. Um, so those are going to bring impulses towards the cell body. And there may, a nerve may have hundreds of these. Um, and then, of course, we have the axion that conducts the impulse away from the cell body. And it may only have one, um, but uh, arising from the axon hillock, but, there may, and it, but it may, some of them may branch too. So they're not all, always the same looking because remember I told you there was different types of neurons. Um, but the axion hillock is important and it's got to reach threshold. It's got to reach a point to where that the signal is strong enough for threshold to occur at the hillock before that impulse is sent down the rest of the axion. Okay, so axions end in axion terminals. So the terminal end, the very far end of the axion or the nerve, is the axion terminal. They contain those vesicles that we talked about a little bit in chapter six, with that have those neurotransmitters in them, the chemical messengers that'll go across the gap between the nerve and whatever organ, tissue, muscle, or whatever it is that it's communicating with. Remember, Nerves don't actually make physical contact with the tissue that they're trying to stimulate. Um, they, they, use the, they use neurotransmitters, these chemical messengers, to do that. There's several different neurotransmitters. I think there's somewhere in the line of a hundred of them, and believe me, we're not going to talk about them. Um, we might talk about a couple of them, but we're not going to talk about all those different neurotransmitters that are out there, but there's several of them that the body utilizes. Um, and these axion terminals, of course, they have that gap junction with the little synaptic cleft that's between there and the, the organ and the neuron. Um, and then what we refer to, um, but that synapsis is that junction between nerves. So we have a cleft that's between uh, adjacent neurons and a synapse between nerves. Um, so it's a little different in the brain than it is at the tissue, at least how we refer to it, because the nerves that are communicating with each other, nerve to nerve in the brain, there's a gap between them too. They're not actually making contact and they're still using chemical messengers as well to communicate with each other or between each other. Okay, just another picture of that. Um, come on, there we go. All right, myelin sheaths are a, a whitish, fatty material covering the axons. We talked about this. Um, the ones that we typically see or the ones that we typically think of is, are the ones in the peripheral nervous system that are covered by the Schwann cells um, um, that wrap around those. And those uh, little nodes, the little spots that it leaves on there that are called the nodes of Ranavir. Um, and then there's the gaps that are, that are that those gaps, those nodes along the way, they call them the nodes of Ranavir. Oftentimes we just call them the nodes or the gaps, the gap, you know, in between there. So um, oleodendrocytes also create some myelin sheets around axions, but that's in the central nervous system. We'll see Schwann cells in the peripheral, oleodendrocytes in the central. Um, and what these myelination is intended to do is to speed the impulse of the nerve transmissions. So it'll make that nerve... Uh, transmit its impulse much, much faster by being myelinated. Um, and we can see how this sheathing works or how this sheathing is wrapped around these cells. It's tightly wrapped around these cells. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, most neuron cell bodies the, are found in the central nervous system um, and not in the peripheral nervous system. Most of the cell bodies are in the central nervous system. Um, when we see gray matter, it is uh, cell bodies and unmyelinated fibers. Um, so whenever you say, whenever you hear somebody refer to a head injury and they say they could see gray matter, that's never a good thing because that's cell bodies. Um, it is exposed cell bodies. 
Um, and usually that means the damage, um, the, the damage is very, very significant. Um, now, uh, when we have clusters of cell bodies in the central nervous system, the nuclei of those oftentimes shows itself as white matter, um, which also is very bad. Gray and white tissue from somebody's brain is never, never a good sign. Um, and of course, um, uh, we have some ganglia uh, um, that are just basically collections of nerve bodies outside the central nervous system. Now remember, most cell bodies are found in the central nervous system, but not all of them. Um, oftentimes, the, we see clusters or collections of those cell bodies outside the central nervous system, and we refer to those as ganglia. Um, it's usually some kind of connection point or a plexus or something like that where um, there's a lot of um, neural activity that, that requires cell bodies in that particular area. Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, well, the way, that, the way that the structure of the central nervous system is, it refers to the bundles of nerves that pass through the central nervous system in tracks. Um, and then in the, in the peripheral nervous system, those nerve bundles are usually just referred to as nerves. Um, it's tracks in the central nervous system because they're so packed together and, they, and they're going through the spinal cord and, the, and it's literally like a highway of them. In the peripheral nervous system, they branch out so much that it, it, they're no longer uh, a highway like or, you know, or, or a bundle of them running together. Um, uh, white matter is a collection of myelinated fibers um, and gray matter collection of mostly unmyelinated fibers. Now, remember we're talking about um, as, as they pass out of the, you know, usually down the spinal cord. Um, we talked about this just a little bit earlier, we're backing up to the afferent neurons, the neurons that are bringing impulses from the receptors um, to the brain. Um, uh, and the, those are coming from different organs or receptors, stretch or tension receptors in the body. Uh, to, they're carrying those impulses into the brain, um, and we can kind of see that, uh, um, yeah, and it's showing, it's showing these receptors down here. Hang on like, just a second. We can see uh, this is the afferent transmission. It's bringing it into the brain. So on the afferent side, we have dendrites that are actually receiving signals here. And it's bringing it in, bringing it up here into the spinal cord. Now we got this little interneuron right here um, that actually, if it's a reflex neuron, um, it would carry this impulse here. And if it was strong enough to, to remember, if we had a strong enough signal here, it would cause this hillock to fire off and, and immediately send a signal back this way. If that was the case, say we stepped on a thumbtack, um, and this down here was on the heel of our foot. These, this was representing the heel of our foot. It sent this signal up here and it was a really, really strong signal that came in. It would not only go to the brain, which up the spinal cord, um, but it would also jump this inner neuron because it would fire off this hillock here and cause this to send a signal down here, right? Right down here to, to our lower leg and tell us to lift our foot. Um, and it, would, it would be something that would happen before really the signal even got to our brain or almost simultaneously with the signal that got to our brain that we've stepped on attack or we've step, stepped on something sharp. Oftentimes it happens that this arc reflex, this reflex right here that happens, happens so quickly or that, that in the time that it takes for the impulse for the, for the ouch to get to our brain, our foot's already on the way to being moved. Um, it's just a natural reflex in the body. It's a protective feature um, that keeps us safe. Um, and that followed right along when it, when it jumped that. It went back down an efferent neuron to carry it back from the central nervous system to the muscle that caused it to move. Um, and, of course, that interneuron was, uh, was a key player in that that allowed that impulse to, to jump the gap there. There's that picture again. Okay. All right, neurons are also classified according to their structure, and oft it's uh, based upon the number of processes extending from the cell body. Multipolar neurons have many extensions from the cell body. Um, all motor and inner neurons are multipolar, 
and it's the most common structure. This is the most common neuron look that we're used to, to seeing. Uh, most of the time, this is what we think about uh, when we think of a neuron, um, but they're not all that way. We have bipolar ones um, located in special sensual organs such as uh, the nose and eye. We don't have a whole lot of them as adults. The most of them have gone away, but this is what a bipolar one looks like. Okay, Unipolar um, have short single processes. Sensory neurons of the peripheral nervous system and conduct in, uh, impulses to and away from cell bodies. Um, we can kind of see how that one looks, but notice it's myelinated too, so it's going to carry impulses pretty fast. Okay, so um, how neurons work. It's important in order for a neuron to work properly, um, it needs to have some, uh, some abilities to do some things. Um, the first of which it needs to be irritable. Um, who would have thought that that would be a good thing to be? Um, but for a nerve, it's a very good thing to be. Um, it's that ability to respond to something and convert it into a nerve impulse. Um, so it receives a signal and it converts it into a nerve impulse that it can pass on. Um, but in order for it to be able to pass that on, it needs to be conductive. It needs to be able to transmit the impulse to other neurons, muscles, glands, whatever, um, inner neurons and that kind of stuff. So it needs to be irritable and conductive. It also needs to be prepared. It needs to be in a state that actually allows it to be able to respond. So what that is, is we call that a, a resting state, um, oftentimes referred to as resting potential. Um, and a resting neuron has a membrane that is at rest, but it is polarized, meaning it has, it's a, there's, it has a lower voltage inside of the cell than there is on the outside of the cell. Remember when we talked about um, um, ions, different ions in the body, positive and negatively charged things? Um, well, and then we talked about sodium and potassium pumps. Well, what happens with neurons and many other cells of the body um, is the body will, or those cells will, put themselves to a point to where that the inside of the cell is more negative, negatively charged than the outside of the cell. And they do that by pumping more sodium out than they pump potassium in. Um, so they pump a lot more sodium out and then they create this imbalance of not only sodium, but an imbalance of potassium and voltage um, that it creates a kind of a negative voltage, well, literally a negative voltage inside of the cell. Uh, as long as that stays that way, that cell is considered to be at rest. Because um, we wind up with, like I said, you have less positive ions inside of the cell than there are outside because we've pumped more sodium out. We've pumped some potassium in. There's more potassium inside the cell than there is concentration-wise, more potassium inside the cell than outside, and a lot more sodium outside of the cell than inside. So that creates a negative environment inside of the cell and that makes the membrane of that cell the key player in holding back the flood, okay? So we can see that right here. Here's the resting uh, membrane. It's polarized. You can see the inside of that is more negative than the outside. Um, and then what happens is, is when we have an action potential that generates an impulse, basically we have a stimulus that depolarizes the nerve's membrane, the neuron's membrane. Um, and that membrane becomes permeable to sodium. So we, have, we stimulate that membrane, and it opens up the sodium channels on that membrane. And then when that happens, it allows sodium to rush into the membrane, and that sodium all of a sudden becomes more positive. Now, it was negative. Now it's going to become more positive. The membrane right next to where that happened that causes that, that part of that membrane to be stimulated as well, so its sodium channels open, sodium rushes in, it causes the membrane piece next to that one to do the same, and that's going to run the length of that nerve. So that's how that action potential happens. So right here, it's showing the sodium, where, where we, have a, we have a stimulus here that takes place, right here, we get a stimulus that takes place and it allows sodium to rush in, all of a sudden, this part of this neuron starts to become more positive. It, 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 actually, the inside of this becomes more positive than even the outside. 
because so much sodium rushes in and not much potassium is rushing out yet. It's going to, but it's, it's working on it. So it changes the polarity of that right where that's at. So in order for this to happen, it needs to happen with a strong enough um, impulse. Um, once that leads to the movement of ions, it initiates that action potential in the neuron. Now, we can have a graded potential where the inside of the membrane is more positive and the outside is less positive, um, which is what we're talking about. Um, or, well, uh, sorry, no. Um, we can't have that. But if the stimulus is strong enough and the sodium influx is high enough, local depolarization will activate the neuron to conduct that impulse all the way down its length. So um, if it's not a strong enough one, it'll be more of a graded potential, and we won't really get a whole lot of movement from that. Um, but if it's strong enough, it'll go down to full length. Um, like this right here, you can see that the inside is now more positive than the outside. Got all we have on the outside, there's so much sodium has rushed in there that all we've got uh, these four little negatives out here and we've got five positives inside. So it's more positive. Now the inside of it's now positive. It was negative. Over here it's negative. Over here it's still negative, but right here it's all positive. So it's changed it. And that right there, this positive right here is going to cause that same thing to happen right here. It's going to make the next section over or what's adjacent right next to it do exactly the same thing. It's strong enough. It's generated what we call an action potential. Um, it, it has created a, a strong enough that it, this is going to go down the length of that because it's an action potential. Okay, So that's what's happening right there. Um, once we have enough sodium enter that, it starts the propagation over the entire axion. And it's a one or none response. It means once we've reached that point, it's going to go. No matter what, nothing's going to stop it. It's not going to get halfway down and go, oh, well, we've run out of steam. Nope. Once it's reached that threshold, it goes, no matter what. Um, and, of course, those fibers that have the mylian sheaths are going to conduct that more quickly because it'll jump those nodes. Remember the nodes of Renovere? It's going to jump from. It's going to jump across the nodes. It won't have to travel that distance that's underneath that um, uh, Schwann cell that's surrounding it. It's going to jump it. Um, don't ask me how. It just does it. <laughs> um, so we see that Paul impulse begin to move down that, um, and it's going to go down the down the length of that. And then as that rushes down that and moves down that, behind it, it's kind of like a wave of water. Um, behind that, we're going to start to see that axion or that nerve begin to repolarize. As those potassium ions rush out of the cell, remember all the sodium rushed in, now some potassium starting to go out. Potassium is positively charged. And now that membrane is going to start to repolarize. And what it'll do is it'll start getting back to, we, we started at negative, sodium rushed in, we went to positive. Now potassium is going to start to go out and it's going to start to go to zero. Okay. And it's going to start to restore the negative charge in that. And then, um, then the sodium and potassium pumps will actually kick in to try to pump the sodium out and the potassium back in um, to try to get it back to that resting potential so that it can it can um, become, uh, it can actually be used again. It can take another in impulse. Um, like I said, that hole that is completely restored by the use of sodium potassium pump. Remember that sodium potassium pump requires ATP. Um, we just talked about that in the last chapter, how ATP is created and how dependent it is on glucose and Krebs cycle and glycolysis and oxygen and all that kind of stuff. So in order for nerves to work properly and function properly, we have to have plenty of oxygen and plenty of glucose. So if you think about this, what happens when we see somebody that's having trouble breathing? When somebody's having trouble breathing and they start to get in a deficit for oxygen, they don't have enough oxygen, they don't think clearly. That's because their neurons and their brain aren't functioning properly because they can't reset. They don't have the ATP it needs to reset quickly enough. So everything slows down. Sure, they reset, but it's a it's much slower process. Or, for instance, if we have somebody that's a diabetic and they're unable to get glucose into their cells. Now, diabetes, being a diabetic, you can have plenty of glucose, but if your body can't get it into the cells, and we'll talk about that in the endocrine system, but if you can't get the glucose to where it needs to be to start the Krebs cycle, then it's not going to do you much good. Um, so we start to see the effects of somebody with... Um, without enough glucose in their cells, 
they start to give uh, they start to show signs of grogginess, lethargy, incoherentness, and coma. Um, so that's what's happening is, is these neurons are actually suffering because they can't reset. They can fire off, but they can't reset. It requires ATP to do that. Remember, three sodium ions are ejected for every two potassium ions that are taken in. So we remember we're pumping against the flow. Um, we're pumping against the balance. balance. We're pumping out more sodium. We're pumping in more potassium, but we're pumping out a lot more sodium than we are potassium, and it creates a negative environment inside of the cell, and we get that cell repolarized. So we see the diffusion sodium potassium pump doing its thing, getting everything set. Um, here's the thing. Then when that action potential, that nerve impulse that we've triggered, goes down to the end of that neuron and it reaches the terminal, the end, the end plate of that, um, it's going to trigger, that electrical charge is going to trigger calcium channels in the end of that to open. Calcium is going to rush in and trigger the release of a neurotransmitter. Okay? So that's what's happening here. Um, we talked, we've seen this slide before. Um, action potential comes down. It causes, lets calcium rush in, causes the release of uh, um, a neurotransmitter from those vesicles. Um, usually when we're, the, one of the main ones that we talk about is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is, is a neurotransmitter on the uh, muscle side of things, right? But acetylcholine is also the one for the parasympathetic nervous system. For the sympathetic nervous system, it's epinephrine, norepinephrine, you know, some of those like that, dopamine, dobutamine. Um, those are the ones on the sympathetic side of the nervous system. So, um, and, and those happen in different places. Um, and remember, when we're talking about sympathetic, parasympathetic, we're mainly talking about organs, body organs. Not so much talking about, we're, well, we're not talking about muscles. We're talking about organs, you know, heart rate, breathing, those types of things. Um, so if we want the heart to speed up, the body will release epinephrine um, in, this, in this cleft right here. Um, the sympathetic side of the nervous system will release epinephrine here. And this would have to be, this nerve would have to be a sympathetic nerve, right, in order for that to happen. Because a par it, it's not parasympathetic and sympathetic. Remember, nerves have one purpose. They can't do, serve dual purposes. Now, what we would have with the heart is we would have two nerves. One nerve from the sympathetic, one nerve from the parasympathetic. Both of them are releasing small amounts of epinephrine or as the case with the parasympathetic side, acetylcholine. Um, but when the sympathetic side takes over, it will release more epinephrine and the sympathetic, parasympathetic side will release less acetylcholine. So they're using different neurotransmitters to get different effects, okay? So hopefully you guys are, are catching on to that, that different neurotransmitters are, are being used by different sides of the autonomic nervous system. So now that calcium, like I said, it's going to release the neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter is going to depend on what nerve it is. If it's a nerve to a muscle, it's going to be acetylcholine. If it's a nerve that's going to a parasympathetic side, it's going to be acetylcholine. If it's a nerve going to the sympathetic side, it could, you know, it could be epi, nor epi, and it could be a number of ones, okay? And that's kind of some generalities, okay? Realize there's, there's more neurotransmitters out there than that. And I'm speaking in, in very, gen, very vague generalities, so you can kind of tie these together. So neurotransmitter goes across. It makes contact with the channel on the opposite side. Um, uh, whatever that ion channel is that's going to cause that to open up, a lot of times it's a sodium ion channel that causes, lets sodium rush into there. Um, um, it's going to open up those channels, and it's going to let that, it's going to open that receptor. These things, it's way behind me. I'm way ahead of it. Okay. Um, if enough of that neurotransmitter is released, a graded potential will be generated. And eventually a, a full-on action potential will occur in the neuron beyond the synapses or in that target organ. So once enough of a neurotransmitter has been sent across this gap to cause this membrane over here to let enough sodium through that it causes a change in here, you know, down the line, and then it's triggered, it's going to go along the length of this membrane 
both ways and cause that membrane to generate that action potential so that that impulse that's coming down from here can be moved on to create to make that target tissue organ or whatever it is do its thing okay all right so that's what the neurotransmitter does is it's like a key in a lock um, we put the key in the lock and it opens the door and sodium rushes in and it causes that uh, that membrane on the target organ or the target tissue or even the target neuron to open up um, there's a brief binding, but that trans neurotransmitter is quickly removed by either reuptake or an enzyme. So we talked about with skeletal muscles, it's an enzyme that helps do that. Um, also, some of it's reuptake and some of it's just broken down and dissolved. Um, the key breaks off or whatever and it can't be used. Um, and that impulse goes away and then the, the, the target or the target um, tissue or cell or whatever it is tries to get back to its resting potential. The membrane tries to get back to normal. Okay? It's broken down. All right? Um, this, we've seen this, and there's actually some better videos on your, uh, that's under this folder to watch about this. Um, feel free to watch this one if you want, um, but for time purposes, I mean, we're already pushing an hour. we still got quite a ways to go. Um, I'm just going to opt to move on. Um, and you guys can watch this on your own time, okay? All right, so the body has some reflexes as well, some built-in reflexes. I talked about these briefly, but the, the great thing about these are is that they're rapid. They are predictable, but they're involuntary, and they're a response to a particular stim stimulus. Um, uh, and uh, these happen over natural neural pathways called reflex arcs. Um, and we've looked at these just a little bit before, um, for instance, here we've got a, a stimulus of a neuron on the skin. We get poked with a needle. It goes there. It goes to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord says, "Hey, look, um, we need to deal with this now. We're going to send the signal onto the brain, but we're going to also send a signal back because this interneuron here in between it was a strong enough stimulus that it caused a threshold to be reached, and it propagated that impulse back to the effector muscle um, that's going to pull it away. Okay, so." That's what a reflex arc is. Um, there's somatic reflex arcs that, um, that work with skeletal muscles, pulling your hand away from a hot object. And there's autonomic that regulate the activity of smooth muscles, hearts, and glands, um, those types of things. So there's different types of reflexes depending on what's going on. And they don't, remember, these don't always, these don't in, have to have brain involvement. They don't require us to think about it or the brain to actually process it and do something. These are instances where something is so significant enough that it's not necessarily going to cause fatal harm if it's not addressed, but you know, with the somatic nervous system, um, with the skeletal muscles, you know, you might fall on the floor if, uh, um, if you're one of your stretch receptors in your muscles is activated and you don't respond to it, okay? So there's five elements of a reflex. We have a receptor that reacts to a stimulus, a neuron that carries the message to the integration center, which is usually located in the spinal cord, that center processes that information and directs motor output. Really, it just jumps the interneuron because the stimulus is strong enough to cause it to jump that. That neuron that it carries the message back to the effector, back to the muscle or the organ or the target, um, and then that gland will be muscle or gland will be stimulated to do whatever it is it's supposed to do. And that's all this is showing us. We get poke, poke with a needle. Um, it sends the message to the to the spinal cord hits that inner neuron, and it hits that with a strong enough force that, that, that it goes ahead and sends the signal back around that arc as well as to the brain, and then it sends it to the motor neuron um, that it gets to the target muscle that's going to make us pull our hand away um, because that hurt. Um, there's two neuron reflex arcs. This, there's, uh, the, is, the two neuron reflex arc is the simplest type. It's that knee-jerk reflex. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when the doctor takes the little rubber hammer and hits you right underneath the knee, what ha what's happening there is that they're hitting the, they're causing in that tendon, they're causing the stretch receptor in that tendon to be activated. And the, and the, the uh, spinal cord is saying, hey, whoa, hey, look, we need to tighten, uh, tighten that back up because we're going to fall. It's a reflex um, uh, for your body to kind of keep, help keep your balance. Um, so it's just responding to that. Um, and here's an example where, you know, what happens when we do that. 
Um, you can do this on yourself, um, and you can do it as many times as you want. Uh, you can even try to, the only way you can keep yourself from doing it is if you tighten up the muscles in your legs, and sometimes that doesn't even stop it from happening. Um, it's kind of funny. Three neuron reflex arcs have five elements, receptor, sensory neuron, inner neuron, motor neuron, and effector. Um, it's that withdrawal reflex, so there's a little bit more involved here than, than just your standard reflexes. You know, this is that whole thumbtack thing pulling away, so there's usually more muscle groups involved in this. Um, so, um, a little bit more going on there, okay? All right, so the central nervous system develops from the embryonic neural tube. Um, this tube becomes the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and then the opening in the neural tube becomes the ventricles. There are four chambers within the brain. Should be easy to remember. There's four chambers of the heart and there's four chambers of the brain. Most people don't realize that there are liquid-filled chambers in your brain, but there are. Um, and they're filled with cerebral spinal fluid, not blood or anything weird like that. Um, just four chambers within the brain. And there's the neural brain at 13 weeks. Um, doesn't really look much like a brain. Looks like some weird uh, cartoon creature. Um, and there is the human brain. And you can see those ventricles in there. Don't look at all what you would think they would look like. Um, but those are the ventricles. Okay. All right. Regions of the brain. Um, the brain is broken up into different regions in order for us to better identify um, the different parts of the brain. Uh, some parts are relatively indistinguishable from others, um, whereas some, some parts are pretty obviously different than others. But through a lot of research, they've managed to be able to pinpoint different areas of the brain that are responsible for different things, and they've come up with names for them. <clears throat> Realized that they still don't know all there is to know about the brain, that there's still a lot to be learned. Um, but they've, they've learned a lot over the years. So here are the regions of the brain. We have the hemispheres, the dicephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. We'll look at these a little bit closer, and here's a kind of a picture of some of those. Um, we can see the cerebral, and we can see the cerebral hemispheres are the largest. <clears throat> the dicephalon's buried down in the middle. The cerebellum is kind of oftentimes called the hind brain, and then that green is the brain stem. So if we look at these and their functions, we can see on this chart the different things that they do and what's contained in them. Um, there's uh, uh, a lot of the uh, hemispheres had to do, have to do with skill, muscle memory, voluntary stuff, intellectual things, and emotional processing. We get into the dicephalon, and that's a little more uh, uh, autonomic nervous system stuff, things that are beyond our control, chemical things, uh, emotional states, and all that stuff, um, even some memory processing down there in the limbic system. Um, the brain stem, um, it's a lot of relay information, but it also contains uh, the medulla oblongata that um, has those sensory pathways, um, but also is uh, um, the nuclei, the nuclei area that controls the heart rate, blood vessel diameters, respiratory rate, vomiting, those kinds of things are controlled right there in that particular area. Uh, so that area is, is one of those. Remember, um, you know, when I was talking about the spine, when I said if you fracture your spine at, you know, vertebrae one or two, um, it's a very likely is going to be fatal because it severs or it can damage that medulla oblongata right there where it's transmitting the heart rate so your heart stops beating or you stop breathing. So the cerebral hem hemispheres are paired in right and left. Um, <clears throat> it includes more than half of the brain mass. And of course, the surface of that, when we look at it, it's got all these grooves and ridges and all that stuff. The ridges are called gyri and the grooves are called sulci. Um, so if you see something called gyri or sulci or sulcus or something like that, it's usually referring to a ridge or a groove. Um, and usually that's because it's trying to determine or it's trying to point out a dividing line between something. Um, there's three main regions of the cerebral hemisphere. We have the cortex, which contains the gray matter. We have the white matter and then the basal nuclei, which are in deeper pockets of that. Um, we'll see a picture of it here in a minute. Um, then there's some lobes of the cerebrum. Um, that there's some deep grooves that divide the cere cerebrum into lobes. 
um, and those lobes are the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. <clears throat> and it's just a, a way of dividing the brain into parts. We haven't really started talking about what's going on in, in those parts or those areas, but it's a way of dividing that. Now, if you look at this, you can actually see some dividing lines where you see some sulci that are a little bit deeper, um, and you know, that's creating deeper fissures along the brain that's giving us some dividing lines. And that's one of the ways that they determined, you know, how to divide these different parts of the brain up. <clears throat> so, so uh, um, the cerebrum has some specialized areas. Um, there's a primary somatic sensory area that receives impulses from the body, from pain, temperature, touch. Um, those are mainly located in the parietal lobe. Um, and then there's this sensory homunculus um, is a spatial map. So um, the homunculus is kind of interesting. It's that spatial map so that we determine where a particular sense, sense is coming from. Um, we've all probably had this sense of, uh, you know, we have an itch on our arm or a mosquito biting us on our arm and we either go to scratch it or slap at it and we completely miss the mark um, because for some reason where we're sensing and where it is on the map are two different things. Um, watch a newborn or watch a, watch a, a, a toddler learning how to eat, uh, sitting there uh, at their, um, you know, in their, sitting there at the table eating um, and trying to get the spoon in their mouth. Uh, that is, they're trying to learn their, their, they haven't learned that spatial map yet. It had, the spatial mapping isn't mapped out yet in the homunculus because um, that's where it's happening. Um, the left side primarily receives somatic sensory information from the right side of the body. So when we have somebody that, say, had a stroke that's damaged the right side of the brain, we see paralysis on the left side of the body. So uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, it's somewhere around... Um, Somewhere around the, the start of the spinal cord is where that brand, where that crosses over. So uh, the left side of our brain and our, the left side of our head um, are all controlled by the same, but the left side of our brain controls the left side of our head and the right side of our body. Um, kind of kind of weird, um, and it and it maybe explains a little bit more why uh, it's so hard to learn how to walk when we're little or ride a bike or those kinds of things um, uh, because it's controlled backwards, it seems like. Um, and we can see uh, uh, the different areas, and see they're showing that right up there at the top, the central sulcus, um, because it's kind of a dividing line um, between that. So uh, we can see uh, the, the, uh, um, the frontal lobe up here in the very front of the brain. It's one of the slowest areas of the brain to develop. This part of the brain up here is the frontal lobe, um, and it has a lot to do with these two areas um, and, and also here, um, working memory and judgment, problem solving, language comprehension. Oftentimes that area of the brain isn't fully developed until 22 to 25 years old in most people. Um, it's why teenagers and young adults wind up getting themselves in trouble. It's because they have poor judgment, um, because this area of the brain is not fully developed. If you want to know where your speech comes from, Broca's area. Um, if you have a stroke that affects Broca's area, it's going to affect your speech. Um, it doesn't show Warinke's area that has to do with auditory. I think it's on the other side. Um, usually Broca and Warinke's are on opposite sides of the brain, but sometimes they'll be on the same side. So though they've kind of mapped out where things are in the brain, not every single brain is the same. Hmm, weird. Um, some of us are wired a little different. Um, not a bad deal, though. Um, it's what makes, what makes the world go round. Um, there are three areas uh, that are involved with special senses. The visual areas in the occipital lobe in the back of the brain. Um, the auditory areas are in the sides and the olfactory is in the temporal. Um, so auditory and olfactory are in the temporal areas. So uh, we see from the back of our brain and we hear and smell from the sides of our brain. Um, the, there are some specialized areas of the, the cerebrum. Um, there's a motor, primary motor area that sends skeletal impulses um, located in the frontal lobe. Um, uh, these, uh, and of course it's got that homunculus, the spatial map in that area as well, so uh, uh, it can refer to the map of, of what's going on or where it's at in the body. 
And, and we can kind of look at that on this picture. It kind of gives us that, uh, how the body sees the spatial map, how it's got things kind of mapped out of where they're at. It's interesting because, um, say, if uh, you have a gallbladder flaring up, oftentimes a gallbladder flare-up is, uh, is, is shows itself as pain in the right shoulder. Why pain in the right shoulder? Well, it's because up until that point in time, your gallbladder wasn't on the map. Um, so your, bo your brain is trying to process where that is. Um, so it's, uh, it's having difficulty with that. Also, if you'll notice on this map, look at the size of the hands. The hands occupy, you know, are, are a vital part of the body um, for sensory purposes. Um, so it, it, it takes a larger part of the brain, as does the face. Um, uh, so we can kind of see how that plays out in the, in the homunculus spatial mapping. <clears throat> Broca's areas are involved our area to speak, usually in the left hemisphere, but it can be in the right hemisphere. Um, and of course, there are uh, other specialized, specialized association areas of the brain. Um, there's another uh, speech area of the brain that processes speech. One has, Broca's area has to do with our, how we speak or the ability to speak. There's another area, and I can't remember, that could be Warinke's. Um, I was thinking Warinke's was hearing, but it could be Warinke's area that has the ability for us to process speech, to understand speech. So um, they're not always on the same side of the brain. Um, of course, there are layers to the cerebrum. Um, there's some gray matter that's the outside layer and the white layer that's on down in there, and then we have that basal layer. We, this, this slide's kind of repeating itself because this was back a few slides back that it talked about this, <clears throat> but we can see the cutout of it down here on the bottom where they're talking about those areas of the brain. <clears throat> it's just the layers of it, how it's layered. Okay, the dicephalon sits on top of the brain stem. Um, it's enclosed by the cerebral hemisphere, so it's inside of the brain. It's deep down in there. Three parts, the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. Um, um, these are regulatory parts of the brain predominantly um, that, uh, that have a lot to do with what goes on within the body. And we can kind of see there the thalamus, um, it's up by the third ventricle. Um, it's a relay station for sensory impulses, so it's going to process some things um, and it's going to try to transfer things to the correct part of the body. Remember the analogy or the, the picture that I gave you about the, the telephone operator that was making sure that the calls were going to the right people. Well, that's what the thalamus is doing. It's, it's directing traffic. The hypothalamus is under the thalamus, obviously. It's hypo, so it's below it. It's part of the autonomic nervous system, regulates body temperature, water balance, metabolism, those types of things. Um, the, you know, when somebody, you know, has a underactive or overactive you know, hormonal problems in their body. Sometimes it is correlated or related to the hypothalamus. Um, it also houses that limbic center of the body for emotions, um, and it regulates uh, the pituitary gland, um, uh, the, and also the sense of smell. Epithalamus, the roof of the third ventricle, um, includes the carotid plexus and floor, forms cerebral spinal fluid. So it's, it's our cerebral spinal fluid creator. Um, the brain stem attaches to the spinal cord. Um, it's that intermediary between the brain and the spinal cord. Um, the parts of it is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Um, right in here, I, th I believe, is where that crossover takes place in the brain to the body. Um, I believe that's taking place here. Um, the brain stem is absolutely vital, as vital as any other part of the brain, if not more so. It is the connection. It is the main connection link between the brain and the body. Um, uh, damage to this area right here, um, it doesn't take much damage to this area for it to mean death. Um, and if you'll think back to that picture of the brain or picture of the skull with the hole in the bottom of the skull, if we have a brain injury um, in the top part of the brain, um, whatever that may be, whether it's a bleed, whether it's a bleed up in here, or whether it's some swelling or something like that, if that begins to put pressure this way, because all this is filling with fluid, you know, fluid or blood or whatever, and it's putting pressure down this way, what happens is, is this, in the skull, this is the only hole, or the main hole in the skull, and it's going to start to push all of this down this way. 
Eventually, it's going to put so much pressure on this brain stem right here that it's going to occlude it, and it's going to cut it off, and it's going to stop functioning and or stop functioning correctly, and we'll start to see irregular breathing patterns, irregular heartbeat patterns, those kinds of things. Um, oftentimes, we refer to that as Cushing's triad um, because it's a triad of things that are happening that's indicating a brain injury and that that brain injury is progressing. So um, that's what's happening with the brain stem in those types of situations. This up here, yeah, obviously there's probably a significant amount of brain damage happening up there, but what we're seeing is the results of this pressure on the brain stem because that's going to show in the rest of the body. Hard to see what's going on in just the brain itself. We have to look at the rest of the body, what the brain controls, in order to determine what's been damaged. Okay? Okay, and then uh, when we have the midbrain, it's mostly tracts of nerve fibers um, that convey ascending and descending impulses. Um, and then we have the pons. It's the uh, bulging center of the brain stem. Um, it's fibrous tracts. And it, it's where, where a lot of our breathing control happens. The lowest part contains those, in, those control centers that I talked about for heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, swallowing, vomiting, those types of things. That happens right there in the medulla. Um, so it's a vital part, vital, vital part. Um, and then we have the reticular foramen. Um, it's the uh, diffuse mass of gray matter along the brain stem. Motor control of visceral organs. Um, it actually plays a role in the circadian rhythms of wake and sleep cycles. Um, uh, the uh, cerebellum, uh, there's two hemispheres with, uh, with those convoluted looking surfaces. Um, this area of the brain con you know, controls balance and equilibrium, um, and it helps provide precise timing of skeletal muscle activity by coordinating with other body motions and things that are going on. So learning how to ride a bicycle involves, heavily involves the cerebellum um, because all of these things that are happening. Um, and then, you know, when you tease somebody about, well, you can't even walk and chew gum at the same time, well, it's a development of the cerebellum to be able to do that or, you know, to uh, pat, you know, pat your leg and scratch your head at the same time. Um, it's, it's trying to control that muscle activity. And that's this little, um, little cerebellum's there at the back. Um, sometimes it's referred to as the hind brain or something. Um, but that's the cerebellum right there doing all that stuff. All right, so how is the central nervous system protected? Um, it, it is such a delicate and sensitive system, it, it needs to be well protected. Um, so scalp and skin, obviously, that protects everything, protects all of us. But also we have the skull and the vertebrae. We've talked about how it protects it. Something we haven't talked about are the meninges, the cerebral spinal fluid, and the blood-brain barrier, and we're going to talk about those. Okay? So scalp and skin, yeah, we kind of see that. And skull, yeah, we get that. We've talked about that a couple of chapters back. But what are these doggone meninges? Well, these meninges are layers of membranes that surround the brain. So when, when you hear that, I don't know if you've ever heard that song or that saying, insane in the membrane, well, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about brain membranes. So um, the first of these and the most, the toughest, it's almost leathery-like, it's really tough, is the dura matter. It's a double-layered external covering. It's a paraosteum that attaches to the inner surface of the skull. So it's the, it's the layer between the skull and the next layer into the brain, okay? Um, and... Uh, it folds inward in several areas, um, uh, but it's, it's a tough, thick, fibrous layer. Um, the arachnoid layer is the middle layer, um, and the reason why it's called an arachnoid layer is because it has these web-like extensions that look like spider webs. Um, and what these do is it's part of the reabsorption process for cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the problem is, is with that arachnoid layer um, is... Um, in that particular layer, there's not a whole lot of room for blood to move about or fluid to move about. So if there's an obstruction up in there, it gets trapped in there and starts to put pressure on a specific part of the brain. Whereas if it was the dura matter, if it was a subdural bleed, if it was a bleed below the dura matter, it could get more diffuse. It could kind of go around the brain. The arachnoid layer, a subarachnoid bleed, actually would, be stay, would stay in one spot because of the web-like look to it. It can't move around. It traps it in there. And then, of course, there's the pia matter. It's the external layer that clings to the surface of the brain, very thin, very delicate, um, a few cells thick. It's not a real thick 
uh, membrane. But those are the meninges. Those are the, the meninges. Now, those meninges actually cover the brain and they extend down and cover the, the spinal column too. So they extend down the full length of the central nervous system, the brain and spinal column. Another protective barrier is the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it has the composition of blood plasma. It's formed by that carotid plexus in the brain and the ventricles of the brain. This watery cushion protects the brain and it's actually circulated in that arachnoid space, you know, that spider web space. It's actually circulated through there and there's some vent in the ventricles in the brain and the central canal in the spinal cord. There's a canal that runs the length of the spinal cord that has this running through it. Um, uh, and it's just another layer of protect protection. Um, it flows to the ventricles in the subarachnoid space. Um, the, then it goes to the central canal. Some of it goes to the central canal of the spinal cord. Um, and it's absorbed in the dural venous sinus via the arachnoid villi. So it's just this watery, clear fluid that runs the length of, or that, that is uh, um, in those spaces within the brain. Um, the interesting thing about cerebral spinal fluid is it doesn't mix well with blood. So if we have somebody that has an injury and they have blood and clear liquid running out of their ear if they have a head injury, um, if we take a, a, a t piece of tissue, you know, like Kleenex or toilet tissue, and put a drop of that fluid that's coming out of their ear, if there's cerebral spinal fluid in it, we'll see a dot, the blood will be in the middle, and the cerebral spinal fluid will kind of be like a bullseye going around it. So we'll have a red dot in the middle and a, and a, and a clear or a watery dot on the outside of that. And that's an indication of this presence of cerebral spinal fluid. You know, we get a head injury, sometimes we can have cerebral spinal fluid leaking out of an ear or a nose, even an eye, you know, an eye socket or something like that where those bones are pretty thin. Um, it's it's uh, very possible for that to happen. And that's an indication that something has gone really wrong with our protective barriers inside of the brain. And that person is obviously going to need uh, to consult, uh, you know, a neurosurgeon or something like that just to make sure that it's not going to be life-threatening. Another view of the ventricles, um, and we can see that passageway that actually goes down to the to the spinal cord. Remember, the meninges are actually surrounding the brain and the spinal cord as well, so it's circulating that fluid all around the brain and coating it. Oh, there you go. There's a good picture of it, how that's circulating through the brain and around the brain. Okay? Um, there is a condition where we can have too much cerebral spinal fluid. Um, we sometimes see this in newborns. It's called hydrocephalitis or hydrocephaly. Um, I've heard it called hydroencephalitis or hydroencephalus or hydroencephaly. Um, different terms, but all mean the same thing. Too much cerebral spinal fluid in the brain, um, and it's not allowed to drain. It's only possible in an infant because the skull bones have not yet fused, um, and there's room to move. Um, it is very treatable, um, but in an adult, it will almost always result in brain damage before it's ever caught. Um, uh, but it is very, very treatable in an infant. Um, here's a really crazy picture right here of this poor little guy um, that's got to have a, a tube in there to drain that cerebral spinal fluid. And that's what that little tube is in, in their nose. It's to drain that cerebral spinal fluid out. They're not, um, what's happening is, is they're producing cerebral spinal fluid normally, but it's not draining like it should. So they're having to go in there and drain it. If this, if this problem doesn't correct itself, they'll go in there and actually put a stent in there that will drain that. Um, they'll put a little drain tube in that will drain it, um, I believe, into the stomach. Um, so they'll, they'll go in there and, and, and fix that if they have to. Um, it is very survivable, but that does not mean that this poor little guy is completely out of the woods. There may be some neurological issues. Um, that are associated with that, that that may not necessarily be from the hydroencephaly, but it may be just because of the developmental nature. There may be something structurally wrong inside of inside of the uh, the little guy's head that's causing a lot more than just a drainage problem. So, also we have the blood-brain barrier. Um, this has some very difficult to permeate capillaries um, that protect the brain from all the harmful substances. Um, some of the substances that it, uh, well, what it can't protect against, what it, what will go right through, 
Our fats and fat-soluble molecules, respiratory gases, alcohol, nicotine, and anesthesia will pass right through it. Can't stop it. It'll go right through. Um, however, it, it does have the ability to stop other things. Um, <clears throat> uh, water and glucose and those essential amino acids can get right through. Um, and then it'll stop metabolic wastes. Most drugs will be stopped. Non-essential amino acids and potassium ions will actually be stopped by that blood-brain barrier. Now, it's not a physical barrier per se, but yet it is. It, it's not a barrier that separates the brain from everything else, but it's more of a barrier. Remember those oleo, or not the oleodendrocytes, but the GILA cells that protect those uh, the neurons of the brain and the spinal cord? That's what's providing. It's, it's one of those that's actually creating this barrier that's protecting and keeping those things out. So it's preventing those things from passing through. <clears throat> there are certain drugs, um, even certain um, like neurotransmitters that are essential for the function of the brain. Um, dopamine, serotonin, those types of things are essential to the brain's functioning properly and our, our, our feeling of well-being and happiness um, that can't pass that barrier. So only those chemicals have to be made in the brain, produced in the brain, or there's no way to get them in there. So when somebody's suffering from depression or something like that, and we want to increase the dopamine levels in their brain, we can't do it this way. We can't just give them dopamine and it passed that barrier. It won't work. It won't pass across that barrier because the blood-brain barrier will prevent it from doing so. What they have to do is figure out a medication that's going to either keep dopamine the, the little bit of dopamine that's present in the brain, keep it there longer, keep it from being reabsorbed, or something that's going to stimulate the release of dopamine in the brain um, is the way that they usually combat um, those um, uh, the depression. For instance, serotonin is one of those key um, principal players in the feeling of well-being and happiness. Um, one of the antidepressant drugs that's out there now, or the group of them, is called SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. What that means is, is when the brain, with this medication, when the brain releases serotonin, this medication keeps it from being reabsorbed as quickly. So more serotonin stays present within the brain so that a person feels less depressed. Um, and that's typically how medications and drugs work within the body. But when it comes to the blood brain barrier, we ha it, it really is a tricky science because so many things won't cross that barrier um, uh, because of the protective nature of the blood-brain barrier, protecting the brain from toxic things that, that don't need to get through. Okay? So, bad things can happen to the brain. Probably know that by now. Um, and it's bad when it does happen to the brain. Um, from, from simplest, well, these, all of these can be bad or not so bad, um, uh, such as a concussion, which is a slight brain injury. So no permanent brain damage, so they say. Um, if you've watched that movie Concussion with uh, Will Smith, um, I would, if you haven't, I would encourage you to watch it. There's some interesting science in that um, about concussions and about per, you know, repeated conduct concussions and how they begin to damage those uh, cells within the brain. Um, uh, I, I found it to be fascinating uh, that you know, once what they thought was a concussion that heals and does just fine, actually turns out to be not so fine, um, that it doesn't take, you know, but a couple of pretty good concussions to, to begin to cause long-term issues um, as we age. Um, contusion. Um, with the contusion, the destruction of, of uh, neurons actually occurs, um, and those nervous tissue don't regenerate. Remember, um, I told you that neurons have a very limited regenerative ability or repairability, and the further away the damage is from the cell body, the less likely that that repair is going to take place. That's true even in the brain, even when those distances are still relatively short. Um, it's still problematic. Cerebral edema, of course, is swelling and information, uh, a swelling and inflammatory response um, due to some sort of injury, whether it's a contusion or a concussion. We can have a concussion with cerebral edema. Um, but uh, really what we have is a pretty significant injury that fluids and all that stuff has rushed to that part of the brain and caused swelling. The problem is, is that swelling can be so bad that it can begin to kill brain tissue from the pressure within the skull. Um, CVAs or strokes, cerebrovascular accidents, results from a ruptured blood vessel supplying the brain. 
or a blocked blood vessel. Um, and uh, so what happens is, is that ruptured or blocked blood vessel can no longer supply oxygen to that part of the brain and the brain tissue just begins to die. Um, once again, we can't repair brain tissue. It doesn't regenerate. Um, we may have loss of functions or it may result in death if it's severe enough. Um, oftentimes with strokes, we see a condition called hemiplegia. You're probably familiar with paraplegia, quadriplegia, paraplegia where you're paralyzed between, from the waist down, quadriplegia from the, you know, from the shoulders down where all four limbs are, um, and that's usually, that's almost always associated with some sort of an injury. Um, well, hemiplegia has to do with a brain injury and not a spinal cord injury because it affects one side of the body. Stroke on the right side of the body is going to paralyze the left side of the body. Um, so, uh, and that's typically what we see. When speech is involved, we call it asphasia um, because it's involving the left hemisphere. But remember, sometimes that can be on the opposite side and it can be a stroke on the right hemisphere that causes aphasia. Um, there, is a, there is a condition that's very similar to a stroke or a, or a CVA called a TIA, a transient ischemic attack. And ischemia means uh, uh, loss of, uh, you know, of, of uh, oxygen or circulation or something like that. Um, I'm not finding the right word, but ischemia uh, means that that tissue gets hypoxic. It means it goes without oxygen or blood flow. And it's transient because it's like the, you know, the old hobos that used to ride the trains. They were here and there. They called them transients um, because they were here and gone. Um, transient ischemic attack is just a temporary restriction of blood flow. Um, oftentimes, though, it can be a prelude to a more serious possible stroke that may come down the road. Um, there's many, many, many degenerative diseases involving the brain. Um, one of them that, you know, everybody's probably familiar with is Alzheimer's. Um, it's a progressive degenerative brain disease, um, and, it's, and it falls in that. It, these, this is, actually falls in a category of multiple of these degenerative brain diseases um, that is uh, dementia, usually is what it is, uh, often falls under that one umbrella. Alzheimer's is uh, mostly seen in the elderly, but can, it can begin in middle age. Oftentimes it does. Um, what happens is it's, it has to do with abnormal protein deposits um, that get twisted upon the neurons inside of the brain, um, and those neurons no longer can function because it's blocking their impulses of what they're doing. Um, and as that, be, as that progresses, um, remember kind of like uh, when your leg's in a cast and you don't use it, the, the, uh, the muscles in that leg wither. Well, if we're not using the neurons in the brain, they begin to wither. Some of them even begin to die because they become entangled and strangulated by these uh, protein deposits. Um, what we typically see is uh, memory loss, some irritability, confusion, and then hallucinations and death. Um, it is a very frightening, um, a frightening disease because you, uh, you eventually just completely lose who you are. Um, uh, and, and it's very sad for the family to watch go through. The, the only solace is that the, 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 uh, the victim of Alzheimer's, and I say victim because I do think it's, a, it, 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 it's not a crime, but it, it seems like it, they're robbed of something. Um, they typically don't really realize how bad it is for them. I mean, they kind of do kind of early on, but as it progresses, they don't. Um, what it's really, really tough on is the family. Um, if you've... Uh, if you've had an experience with this in your family, my heart goes out to you because it is very, very, very tough. All right? So, spinal cord. Spinal cord extends from the four magnum of the skull to the first and second lumbar vertebrae. 31 pairs of spinal nerves arise from the spinal cord. And it, the spinal cord actually ends around lumbar one or two and it branches out into the cauda equina. It's called the cauda equina because it looks like a horse's tail. Um, and it actually it actually comes out towards your belly button. So um, on the inside of your body, it comes out towards your belly button, and it's like a, it literally looks like a horse's tail, um, if you've ever seen it. So, and that's this down here, down here, down at, way down at the bottom where that comes out. Um, okay. Um, when we look at a cross-section of the spinal cord, uh, the internal gray matter is mostly cell bodies. 
and then there's some dorsal horns that house interneurons, um, and then, uh, then there's some anterior horns that have motor neurons, and then there's gray matter that surrounds that. Don't get all caught up with trying to remember the tracks of these. I just want you to be familiar with some of the terminology in here. I, I'm not going to test you on spinal cord anatomy per se. Um, I'm more concerned with you focusing on more brain related stuff and more peripheral nervous system stuff. Um, don't get all caught up in the spinal cord. All right. Um, and then there's some white matter, the conduction tracks, um, that, and, they, and the directions that they run. There's some afferent and efferent sensory nerves in there. We can see that right here, the cross section. Um, and we can see those nerves that are branching off of it. As the spinal cord progresses down from the brain down to the body, we'll have these nerves keeping coming off of that. Uh, off of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as it goes down because more and more nerves are branching off as it gets further away from the brain. Same meninges covering the spinal cord. Um, uh, then we have spinal nerves that leave at the level of each vertebrae. So on the bottom side of the vertebrae, we usually have a nerve that's running along the bottom side of the vertebrae and also on the bottom side of the rib cage. So the nerves that branch out from the rib cage run along the bottom side of the rib cage. Um, so when a doctor actually puts in a chest tube, he will go over the top of the rib instead of the bottom of the rib. He'll follow along the contour of the top of the rib so he doesn't damage the nerve that's running along the ribs. Um, <clears throat> the uh, peripheral nervous system, like we've talked about, it's the nerves and ganglia on the outside of the central nervous system. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll look at that a little bit, con a little bit closer. Um, the structure of peripheral nerves, I'm just trying to see where they're going with this. Oh, uh, okay. Don't worry about that. Um, the peripheral nervous system is considered to have mixed nerves. We have sensory and motor nerves both there. Um, uh, so um, it's a mixed bag of nerves in the peripheral nervous system. Now there's 12 pairs of nerves that mostly serve the head and the neck, and we call those the cranial nerves. Um, only the pair of vagus nerves extends into thoracic and abdominal cavities. So 12 pairs of nerves, 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and only one of them actually goes into the body. Um, and that goes into the, the vagus. It's called, it's called the vagus nerve down in the abdominal cavities. Um, most of these are mixed, um, but there are three that are only sensory, the optic olfactory and vestib vestibulocochlear, the hearing one. <laughs> so... Um, so uh, most of them are mixed, you know, where they send and receive afferent and efferent, but these three right here only receive. Um, there's a mnemonic if you want to try to memorize all of the cranial nerves in the order of that they are. Um, feel free to uh, follow, you know, follow uh, to to remember this if you want to, but I'm not going to test you on your you knowing what those cranial nerves are because quite honestly. That's just pure memorization. I'm much more interested in your cognition, not so much about memorizing what something is or where something is located. It's far more important that you understand what it is that we're talking about than you are to be able to just regurgitate information. So here's those cranial nerves. You see them numbered 1 through 12 all the way down um, and what they innervate. Um, realize that these come directly off of the brain um, it's why they're called cranial nerves or brain nerves, um, and only one of them actually goes down into the uh, down into the abdomen. Also, some spinal nerves. Thirty-one pairs of spinal nerves that branch off at each level of vertebrae, um, and they're formed by a combination of ventral and dorsal roots, meaning ventral to the front, dorsal to the back. Remember that chapter one stuff: um, ventral and dorsal. Um, and of course, it's named for the region from which it arises. So as it goes down, you can see the the names of those nerves, thoracic nerves, uh, cervical nerves, lumbar nerves, sacral nerves, depending on where they're branching out from or where they're coming from, uh, where they're branching out from the spinal cord is, is where their name comes from. Um, soon after they leave the spine, they divide. They start to branch off and go their, their separate ways. Um, and that branch of the spinal nerve contains both motor and sensory neurons, and there's the dorsal and ventral rami's of those. So just, just more terminology and more um, uh, features um, 
that we can see with those. Um, but once again, don't get all caught up in that. Um, a plexus is a network of nerves. There are several spinal nerve plexuses. Um, it's a network of nerves uh, serving motor and sensory needs of, partic of a limb. Um, and the, basically they start from the ventral rami of the spinal nerves. Um, there are four of those in the body, the cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral. Um, those are spinal nerve plexus. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, you hear fighters say, oh, hit them in the brachial plexus. Um, and it's just a way to, you know, you, you get that brachial plexus nerve wound up and, and, the, and, a, and a boxer or, or a fighter can't fight because um, they, they have trouble moving their arms again. Um, okay. All right. There's a, an example of that. There's a backside, front side and back side. You can see all those um, bundles of nerves as the, the groups of them when they come out. All right. Okay. Back to the autonomic nervous system. Now we're going to talk about this, this crazy little autonomic nervous system a little bit more in depth. Okay. Um, remember, now we've talked about the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, how the peripheral nervous system is branched out into the somatic and autonomic nervous system. Now we're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system and its two subdivisions of sympathetic and parasympathetic. Remember, this is the involuntary side of the nervous system. We can't control it. We don't control it. And these two sides are in constant equilibrium, constant balance, at least for the most part, until acted upon by the brain that tells them to do something different. So we can see the difference between the somatic, somatic and autonomic nervous system. Um, when we look at the somatic system, it's a one neuron system. It originates in the central nervous system and extends to the skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system is a two neuron system, meaning in the autonomic side of the nervous system, there'll be two nerves going to each organ. So there's two nerves going to the heart. There's a, there is a a sympathetic and a parasympathetic nerve, whereas in the somatic side, there's one nerve going to a muscle. So that's what makes it a little bit different. Somatic is skeletal muscles. Autonomic is smooth cardiac muscles, glands, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the neurotransmitter for the somatic is acetylcholine. The autonomic nervous system is acetylcholine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, but acetylcholine is the parasympathetic side. Epinephrine and norepinephrine is the sympathetic side. So they're very specific. Um, this also gives us another breakdown of that, um, of how that looks. Uh, the, and you can see the sympathetic and parasympathetic sides and, and how they're innervated. And they're, they're, uh, they're uh, neurotransmitters that they use. Okay? And, and I do realize, I do realize now, I know you, you guys may be looking at this, and if you haven't noticed it already, look right here. Here's the, the sympathetic side, right? What did I tell you the neurotransmitter for the sympathetic side was? Epinephrine, epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? But what's this acetylcholine doing in here, right? I know you're wondering that. Well, what you, what you need to realize is, is this is, an, a, this is, an, this is interneuron. This is neuron to neuron or neuron to tissue related um, to a certain degree. Now, this actually is on the... The, I believe this is on the kidneys, um, but this is actually releasing it to the organ and then releasing epinephrine in the bloodstream. This one is actually releasing epi at the organ itself. So generally speaking, and this slide is very confusing and I, and I don't really like it, please don't, I, I want you to just kind of ignore the acetylcholine in the sympathetic side of that. I don't want you to think of acetylcholine when you think of sympathetic nervous system. When you think acetylcholine, I want you to think parasympathetic. It is true, yes, it is true that there is acetylcholine in the sympathetic side, but that's not how I want you to think of it. It'll be very confusing for you to try to think of it that way. Acetylcholine with the somatic and parasympathetic, epi, nor epi with the sympathetic, okay? Try to do it that way. Just trust me on that. You'll save yourself a lot of aggravation when, rather than trying to figure that out. Obviously, there's more to the story, um, and if we had a whole lot of time, we could get in-depth into uh, 
why there's acetylcholine here and epinephrine there and that kind of thing, but that's not really where we need to go. Um, so just trust me on that. Um, there are some preganglionic neurons. Now just stick with me on this. Preganglionic neurons were, were, that originate from the craniosacral regions. Um, and th this is talking about the parasympathetic side. The, and then we have these basically, this is, this is just getting really, really wordy. Um, uh, let's just cut to the chase and get to this right here. This is what we want to talk about. Um, without getting real crazy wordy in that. Well, what, what you need to understand is, is we have sympathetic on this side, parasympathetic on this side, right? What I want you to notice is, what I want you to realize is, is the cell bodies, the cell bodies for these nerves that are coming out of this, the cell bodies are in here, okay? The body of the nerve cell is in here, and this is just the tail of it coming out, okay? Just the tail. All right, so the parasympathetic side, here's a ganglion, this is a ganglion, this is a ganglion, this is where these nerves are coming together, right? Um, and this is a ganglion chain right here, all right? So what I want you to realize is parasympathetic has long preganglionic um, nerves, sympathetic has short preganglionic nerves. Um, that's the that's what they're trying to get to in that in that other slide when they're talking about the the preganglion and uh, um, the you know the connections and all that kind of stuff. But what's interesting is as you can see how well these are all pretty much interconnected. So you stimulate this one and you're going to stimulate all these things, right? Right. You stimulate this right here and you got all, all these all the way down. So all these things are going to happen now. Just because we stimulate the sympathetic side of the nervous system does not mean that we are going to wet our pants. <laughs> does not mean that. Actually, what happens is it's more of an inhibitory effect down here with the sympathetic nervous system where that it shuts things down. It turns things off. Um, stomach acid will reduce. Um, stomach churning will reduce. Um, different chemicals that are associated with digestion will be stopped. Um, uh, that kind of thing when we stimulate the sympathetic side versus the parasympathetic side. Now the interesting thing about this is we can actually cause some of these things to happen with the medications that we have at our disposal as healthcare providers. Um, if we give somebody an injection of epinephrine, we are going to cause a sympathetic nervous system response and we can see a lot of these things happen. So we can give somebody Epinephrine, which is uh, a drug that is uh, um, a uh, sympathiolytic, or no, it's a, a sympathetic drug, sorry, it's not a sympathiolytic. Um, or we can give them a drug that actually suppresses the parasympathetic side. Remember, if, if we're on a teeter-totter like this, and, and, uh, and, they're, and they're both balanced, right? But if we actually suppress this side. If we give a drug that pushes this side down, this side's going to take over. We can actually give medications that do that, or we can give a medication that's going to increase this side and as a result will decrease this side. But if we give a medication on this side that decreases the parasympathetic, um, uh, uh, there's a few out there, and if you're familiar with a drug called atropine, Atropine. Atropine, actually, we use it to increase heart rate. We use it to increase heart rate, but atropine doesn't work on this side of the equation. Atropine works on this side. It's a par it works on the parasympathetic side, but it works by blocking the parasympathetic side. It's called a parasympathiolytic. Lytic means to lice, to cut, to block, so it blocks that parasympathetic side. So when we're, we're giving medications for various different things, um, we're trying to act on the different systems within the body. And sometimes it's sympathetic, parasympathetic. For instance, when somebody's in cardiac arrest and their heart has stopped beating, one of the medications that we give is epinephrine. Most people think that we're giving the epinephrine for the heart, but we're really not giving it for the heart. We're giving it for the blood vessels. 
We're doing it for the blood vessels because we want to make them constrict so that when we do CPR, it's a lot easier for blood to move through the body. Um, so that's why we're giving epinephrine. Um, we're not giving it to kickstart the heart, though it, if, though it may have a little bit of an effect there. We're mainly using it to constrict the blood vessels so CPR works better. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. Watch the video that, that's on there too, and that will help. Sympathetics to fight or flight, we talked about this. Unusual stimulus. Remember the E division uh, for exercise, excitement, emergency, embarrassment, those kinds of things is uh, the fight or flight. Um, this one, they call it the housekeeping parasympathetic. I usually called it rest and relax or feed and breed and that kind of stuff um, because that's usually the functions, digestion, um, going number two, going number one. Um, uh, those types of things are associated with that. Um, look, you can look at this chart, and it's in your book too, uh, that will tell you what happens with, with each part of the body if one side is allowed to take over from the other. Remember, though, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, they are like a teeter-totter, like this. They're in balance most of the time, unless whatever happens that allows one or forces one to take over, okay? So they're in balance. So they're both there working. Um, it's just that they're in balance, um, kind of competing equally with each other, okay? All right, how has all this come about? Um, the nervous system is actually formed during the first month of embryonic development, very, very early on. Um, they're, they're finding more, out more and more evidence that um, uh, embryos can feel pain at much earlier than what they had thought. Now, they can't process that pain. They don't know that that's pain, but they do have the sense of ability to be able to feel something at, where, they're, where that, um, their little bodies react or their, you know, the tissue in there reacts. Um, and, and I think they were saying, you know, two to three, four weeks sometimes um, that their ability to actually feel or sense that, the, you know, uh, it senses that there's some, something there. Um, oxygen def deprivation destroys brain cells, um, obviously. Um, the, one of the last areas to develop is the hypothalamus, actually. Um, there are several brain diseases that can affect the nervous system. Um, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, encephaly, uh, which is swelling in the brain, hydrocephalus, spina bifida, uh, where, the, where the, the spine is not properly fused, um, but several congenital issues can happen. Um, several, and premature babies usually have trouble regulating their body temperature because their hypothalamus is really not well developed. Um, this is why with newborns, we have to protect them, um, not let them get too hot, not let them get too cold. We try to regulate their temperature to keep them just right because their hypothalamus isn't developed enough in order for them to control that on their own. Um, as they develop, the motor, con motor control, is, we can usually see that because their myelination, uh, as, as the uh, child's um, nervous system matures, um, it becomes more and more myelinated and as they grow. Um, uh, and that's where we can start to see that motor control start to take place. Um, uh, so as we grow, um, neurons die off and they're not replaced. So as we get older, we actually lose brain mass. Um, uh, it's uh, pretty much unavoidable, um, but a good healthy lifestyle will be helpful at, at staving some of that off. Um, uh, but um, many, many people actually maintain near optimal intellectual function even, even well into their old age. Um, the problem is, is cardiovascular disease is rampant in our country. Um, and it is one of the big causes of declining mental function in, 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 uh, in our society is that cardiovascular disease, and that's primarily associated with diet. The same things that affect your heart that are bad for your heart are actually bad for your brain. Um, and uh, um, those diseases uh, um, that affect your heart oftentimes affect your brain. It's just very, very difficult to make the corrections in your brain, whereas if you've got some constricted or some narrowing arteries in your heart, they can go in there and they can fix that. Um, the, but the, the, the blood vessels in your brain are so, there's so many of them um, that it's nearly impossible to do that. They're doing some, they're making some progress on that, 
um, but it's it's a slow moving progress and um, it's not it's not perfect yet. So that is chapter seven. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I helped you make sense of that. Watch those videos that are there. Um, there's a lot of new information here as well as there was in the last chapter. Uh, I know you're getting a lot thrown at you, but just think the next one is chapter eight and that is the halfway mark. So, um, and it, it actually gets a little bit easier, a little bit um, easier. It's not quite as tough a chapters. These first, you know, six, seven or eight chapters are probably uh, the toughest stretch. And then we'll be able to spread out some of the toughness as we go a little bit farther. All right. See you at chapter eight.